Can I have everyone's attention, please? Oh, everyone's attention. Hey, if you guys want to talk, um, you guys can go outside and talk in the hallway. Um, I'm going to ask the bartenders to stop serving for the next five minutes so we can at least get settled down here. Um, but uh, but then again, hey, uh, it's Monday, right? So welcome to another uh, installment of Mobile Monday, Silicon Valley. Um, my name is Mario Tapia. I'm president of Mobile Monday. Um, I've been working. So how many people here the first time Mobile Monday? Wow. How many people are in the imaging uh, industry? Okay, cool. How many people here have Google Glass? <laughs> wow. Oh yeah, it's cool. So um, tonight, tonight's agenda, um, we'll have uh, basically I have a couple of slides to go through about what is Mobile Monday for a lot of the newcomers. Um, also, we will have uh, AOL. Thanks to AOL, this is their office, by the way. This is the, the Valley office. Um, and we also have a keynote by Carolyn uh, for the ArcSoft to kind of give basically the state of the union on uh, intelligent imaging. And then we'll go into the panel discussion and follow up with networking. And I think uh, I'll for the networking. We still have a bunch of uh, drink tickets left, so I think when, once you wrap up, um, we'll, I'll call up one of the guys with the tickets and see you guys want some more drinks. Um, so about Mobile Monday, it's a, basically we're a nonprofit, um, and we also have a lot of U.S. cities. So we have Austin, Chicago, Silicon Beach, Silicon Valley, D.C. Um, but also we're all over the world. So about 140 plus cities around the world. Um, and a lot of cities, just like tonight, are getting together um, and talking about a topic in the local industry. Uh, so I think that the latest tally is over 13,000 folks uh, in our distribution channels. Um, but roughly it's about a third product marketing, a third business development, and, um, and a third developers. And then we have some VCs and um, design. Okay, who's a designer here? Anybody does design? They're like unicorns. Yeah, once in a while. Um, and then monthly meetups. So kind of like we're, we're really busy. So if you look at it, so this is our monthly topic meeting. So this is where we get the entire ecosystem from a couple of guys in a garage with an idea to Fortune 500 executive um, in, in the audience. Um, we also do our Mobile Monday Labs, which is very technical focused. And last week, how many how many folks went to the one last week? Um, and we were focused on, yeah, so we were doing HTML5 and looking at dev tools. Um, and then we also have our executive dinners. Um, uh, like, yeah, but that's, which, uh, that's not us really eating, but it's kind of some people eating. Uh, there, but um, but that's more of a roundtable discussion. That's invite only. So, um, we all this stuff is done by sponsors. So if you guys are interested, um, you know you guys are interested in doing a topic like this, the meetup is awesome. If you guys are looking for engineers, the labs are awesome. But if you're also looking to just network with very high level founders, executives, the dinners are also a good um, event to sponsor. Um, so how to find us, go to www.mobilemonday.us, you'll find, and that will direct you to the meetup page for this event and for this group. Um, you'll also find us at MomoSD, and then, oh, actually, I have to update this one. So thanks to John, Lynn, where's John? So we're not even So uh, we moved over to YouTube. <laughs> so, so we have like 40, 40 videos on YouTube now, so 40 different events, which is great. I think it goes back almost four years now. Um, and he's kind of our team. So I'm Mario. Mike Chen is somewhere in Rome. Ryan is around here somewhere. Where's Ryan? Ryan should be here. Uh, we have Chelsea, you probably saw at the desk, as well as Monica. Uh, Corinne is not here, but she does. She's, she's, she's always behind the scenes. She's basically our digital person. And then we have John, uh, who also does all our video. <coughs> um, so tonight, it's intelligent imaging. Um, We'll have Yi from Morbius, we'll have John from ZTE, we have Oliver from NG Codec, and VJ from uh, Avairi, 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 it's hard to pronounce, Avairi, Avairi, and then uh, Caroline from ArcSoft. Um, and also, uh, here are some of the partners that we've had in the past, and we keep on, there actually there are more, we have more, more uh, supporters than we can fit on this slide. But then also a great thank you, big thank you, and a bigger round of applause to ArcSoft and to AOL for um, So a little bit about tonight. Um, you know, we're, we're looking at the intelligent imaging and kind of like, why, why is this important to me? Why is it relevant to mobile? Um, so we'll look at it from a couple of perspectives, basically the computer vision part of it. And that's really the intelligence in, in, in the cloud, intelligence on local software, 
intelligence in the, in the silicon to help um, to help uh, with all the heavy lifting of um, of detection and things like that. Uh, we'll also look at applications and use cases like how is this being used today. We'll look at we'll talk about creepy apps and, and creepy you know, creepy scenarios that are actually live today. Um, and also with a little help from Oliver, we'll also get the the, the latest on video codecs. And how many have heard of 4K ultra high definition? Yeah, wow. You've been, to, you've been to Costco lately, haven't you? So, um, so yeah, so I was like, like, this is 4K stuff over the holidays. So, um, so all I will we'll kind of do a little deep dive, hopefully not too, too geeky to, to bore everybody, but more, more interesting than like, and then also we'll kind of look into, you know, how, what, what, what's, what's too much resolution, right? At what point does, does the eye really doesn't, doesn't really matter? So that's kind of what we'll, we'll talk, talk, chat about tonight. Um, I would like to invite um, Josh up here. They talk about AWOL. All right, so I'm just going to say a few words about who we are and then get out of the way and let you guys get on with the evening. Um, so for us at AWOL, we're thrilled to continue to be part of this, to provide the space and, and um, you know, for this event. Uh, for myself, so I'm Josh Levine. I head up mobile sales for AOL. Uh, I've been with the company about three months at this point. Um, I'm a very recent addition. The question I get asked most is, wow, you guys are still around. I had no idea. <laughs> um, I spent about four and a half years at Yahoo most recently. If there are any Yahoo folks in the room, I had a good time there. Um, and a lot of the reason why I came over, um, you know, the mobile marketplace continues to grow. The stat I saw most recently was Gartner projected at the end of 2014 to be about an $18 billion business. Uh, we certainly ourselves have seen this massive shift of audience consuming content across our sites on mobile more than they ever have before. And as the space continues to gel, there's a lot of fragmentation out there from a marketing standpoint. I really fundamentally believe that we'll see a, a wave of consolidation over the next 12 to 18 months. AOL is actually in a really good spot relative to where the market is. And we're sort of focused on these three sort of areas. Uh, premium content experiences, our cross-screen technology. We have a lot of users that still visit us on the PC, mobile, tablet. It's a good place to be. And then obviously we have a lot of great technology um, through the advertising.com acquisition we made you know, 14 years ago or so. And so for us, us along with a lot of other companies in the space are really migrating at a very rapid pace towards a mobile first view of the world. Because in two years time, you know, the PC industry will continue to be what it'll be. But mobile from an audience standpoint, from a content consumption standpoint, most specifically, <coughs> will be the way that a lot of us, a lot of our users, a lot of customers interact with brands, interact with content, interact with utility. And so let me end on that note. I don't want to turn this into anything more than what it just was. Uh, enjoy the rest of the evening. Enjoy the panel. Uh, and thank you guys very much. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Josh. Hey, Caroline, I'll set up for you. Okay, so I'm Caroline Ch Chen Spaulding and I'm with ArcSoft. How many of you have heard of ArcSoft before? Show of hands. Whoa, really? <laughs> Great. So for those of you who don't know about us, we've been around for 20 years now. We're in about a billion devices. We enable a lot of visual technologies and that really spans a very large span of technologies. But um, what's really interesting to us is exactly the question we're exploring today, which is what is the future of imaging? And, you can't really ask about the future without asking about what we're doing today. Right? We're very visual people. We take a lot of photos. I'm just going to take a little show of hands. How many people have taken more than 10,000 photos in their life? Okay, keep it up if it's 100,000. A million. Dude, that's too many. <laughs> but that's really the question, right? How many is too many? How much is too much? And that's really connected to a bigger question, which is, at, at some point, you got to find them, right? So what is relevance? What is relevance in imaging, right? We all know Google, we have text, we know how to find stuff. But when it comes to images and video, it's a big black hole still today. So what is relevance for imaging? What does an image mean to you? What does an image mean to me? And how do companies with technology like ours actually make a difference? So here's a very simple example. 
So if she got married 100 years ago, maybe you care about the picture on the left. If you got mar married maybe last week, this is your picture. If you don't want to get married, you don't care about either one of those. So the, the true problem with imaging is that it depends on so much more than just what you see. And that's kind of the problem with the nut that we're trying to crack here. Right? It's about the content, you know, if it's my grandma, I really care about the one on the left. If it's my wedding anniversary, I better care about the one on the right. But it's also about context, right? So when you're caring about the picture, who's caring about the picture or the pictures, if it's a video, if there's a specific use for it, right? So if you're starting a new business and you're trying to promote your restaurant, you probably know about Yelp, you probably need a picture, what picture you're going to use. So the problem with imaging is that there's a lot of issues with finding the right image, and they don't all have to do with the image itself. So really, imaging today, what it means is a huge puzzle, and it's a very difficult puzzle. Because with cameras, you know, with PCs, with, there's, less, there's not a lot of information in the picture to start with, right? The exit data is almost gone. If you have smartphones, maybe there's location attached to a picture. Maybe you can know who took it, maybe if you were close to someone, but is that really the information that you need? Right? So that's what we're really excited about at ArcSoft because we've been around for 20 years. If you've used a camera, if you've used a PC, if you've used a smartphone, there's a really, really very high chance that you've used our technology. And so what are the different approaches that companies like us are taking to try to crack the nut of what is imaging intelligence? One of the things that we're doing is facial recognition, facial detection. We're not NSA though. <laughs> we don't really do anything about information. Uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with Perfect 365. It's a little app that we launched last year, 20 million downloads, um, I'm almost 25 now. And the, the really interesting thing about facial detection is that it can be used today, sure, to apply makeup automatically, which I'm sure most of you are very enthusiastic about. <laughs> but it can also be used on two-way, right? What if I'm able to know what your mood is based on the two-way camera that's on your smartphone? And based on that, determine whether or not I got the answer right when you were actually looking for an image. There's, so there's mood detection, there's face detection, there's who it is. Of course, there's your pet facial detection if you really want to know where Rocky is today. But there's more than that. There's also, you know, there, there's the rest of our bodies, right? We're more than just a pretty face. So what about gesture? What about your hands? So what if you're able to not just command based on, you know, gestures we're all familiar with, like this one or that one. What if, you know, gesture is all about your entire body, right? And at some point it becomes very cultural. So when you have issues of a gesture like this, depends on who you are and where you are and when you are, they mean different things. So what can we do with gesture recognition, combined maybe with other factors such as facial detection, to really understand what is in the frame and what it means to you? So finally, when you think about multiple images like that, or about gesture, you have to think about video, because it's now the interpretation of multiple frames in a row. So it's not only about content, it's not only about context, it's all about being able to do it in real time on video, which is super easy, right? Yeah. No problem. So we're really excited that we're just really at the infancy, right? So this is just what it could be today, right? There's interpretive gesture if you want analysis in a car, trying to understand what's about to happen before it happens, before you can even see it happen, right? Computers theoretically can analyze a situation much faster than you can, which means it can react much faster than you can. And so on that note, I just want to open the panel, I think it's going to be a really interesting one given who we have, on what image, intelligent imaging is, not just in terms of analyzing the image, but what it is to us and how we interact with the world, right? So what's the road ahead and are you ready? And if you want to learn more about our technologies, I encourage you to go just on our website at www.arxo.com and we also have a demo table at the back. And I can't wait to talk to my fellow panelists. Thank you. All right, guys. Um, panelists, we're going to come up and take a seat.
Cool. Um, so uh, we'll do panelist introductions. So I guess Eve, we'll start with you and then work down the table. Sure. My name is Eve. Uh, we are Warbius. Uh, we are all for integrated visual recognition solutions based in the cloud, which means our technology empowers the computer to have the capability to recognize faces, scenes, objects, and logos all together in real time for images and videos. Hello, I'm Oliver. Um, I work at a, a small startup called NG Codec. Uh, it's a company I founded um, 18 months ago doing next generation video compression. Uh, for the longest part of my career, actually, I worked at ARM uh, for almost 13 years uh, running the mobile activities. I'm Caroline. If you have a short term memory problem, <laughs> I work at Microsoft. We're in a billion devices, and we power basically almost all of the imaging technology we use. I'm Vijay Bachani. I work at Aviary. Uh, what we do is build uh, mobile and web SDKs. Uh, we have uh, iOS, Android SDKs for photo editing. We're in about 7,000 different apps and, and websites. And then we have our own consumer app. Uh, not, as, not quite as big as Arcsos. <laughs> uh, we, have about, we have about 20 million users on our iOS and, and Android mobile apps. My name is uh, John Lin. I'm with uh, ZTE. We're probably around the fifth largest smartphone OEM in the world. Uh, primarily, 40% uh, of our phones, I think, are sold out of China, and the rest probably white labeled under operator brand. So that's one reason why you may not have heard of us. Um, and uh, we obviously get approached by a lot of uh, solution providers around the digital imaging and video space, and um, have uh, spoken with all these uh, companies on this uh, panel in one form or another. Cool, thank you. So let's uh, let's start off with an easy one. What is intelligent imaging? Right? And really, and it, maybe you guys want a really technical discussion, or you want kind of like I'm just I'm new to in imaging discussion. Who wants new to imaging? Technical. Who wants more technical? Okay, all right. So okay, let's get let's get the down and dirty into the into the technical detail. So. So from Ar Arcsoft's perspective, give us, you know, kind of drill down what is intelligent imaging, how are you guys dealing with it, and I think Yi also, you probably have some good stuff to, mm -hmm. to throw in there. Yeah, so we have a suite of technologies, so they're basically algorithm based, right? So the imaging technology is the ability to find the relevant information within a set of pixels <laughs> that just look like dumb pixels and try to get the intelligence out of them, whether, whether or not they like it. Uh, that includes ranges from scene detection to object detection, so we, we've powered everything in, in cameras. So what you're used to today, sunset detection, smell detection, face detection, all of that is probably powered by us. And we're moving into the, the realm in the last few years of multiple images, uh, video. So for example, at CS, we, we announced the only home monitoring solution that can tell you if someone's home. So the ability to, in real time, uh, analyze whether or not what's entering the scene is not just a plant or a car or your cat or your fish, but your husband. So that's basically translate into you know, useful information. It's algorithms to serve you and what's important to you. Mm -hmm. So from my perspective of understanding about what is intelligent <coughs> images, so in the history kind of level of this uh, understanding, it's more about like industry level, some of the manufacturer who use uh, like really tel uh, intelligent images to kind of improve the quality of their parts, their like <coughs> products. Also in some biomedics industries, people use that like cancer scan. But the most like the revolutionary like intelligent images more for consumer <coughs> products, for example, like Google Maps, self-driving car, a lot of like the old ones like they scanner like the barcode scanner and nowadays it's more and more directly coming to with a huge volume of data so how the computer itself can automatically understand what is behind those images it uh, for like easy search abilities for like people to organize manually organize their data how to easily find the relative things behind that it is more to us like the image detects how those things can happen in Tajik automatically in the back end so I'm curious to see when I, how the whole process works. So if I say I'm, I'm an app developer and I go, oh, I want to do facial recognition, some type of cool stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And leverage some of the APIs and services that both you guys have. So, and, and, 
then maybe Vijay, you can chime in and say, okay, so what goes into that? So I, I build an app, a user takes a photo, kind of help me go through that process of does it get sent to the, you know, does it get sent into the internet? Is it? Should we start with like the lower level? Because actually a lot of that happens on your phone before you actually install an image. You want to look at the hardware? Start with the, yeah. uh, let's start with the metal and then work. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the, I mean, as many people may know, you know, sensors don't see in color. What they do is they have a filter that's a Bayer filter. Mm -hmm. And what you have to do then is take the raw data from the sensor and process it in a manner that actually turns it into a nice image. And so there's a lot of hardware in phones, typically called an image signaling processor, or ISP, that does a lot of things to improve the image and get the color. It talks about filtering. It talks about factoring that some of the pixels might be stuck. But all of that happens in your phone before you actually have an image. Well, and then the image gets presented. Yeah, and the, the difficulty is that over the course of time, I mean, there's a there's an optics, there's a physical problem, right, between the where the lens is and where the sensor is, right? And the more that distance is shortened, <laughs> the more problems that you're running yeah. into. And so while we are all wanting better and better photos, we also want thinner and thinner phones. <laughs> and yeah. so that's where software yeah. has to, to kind of overcome some of the limitations that are getting, the constraints that are getting harder and harder on the physical side. A absolutely, but um, you know th that is getting very challenging because as you increase the megapixels, what happens is that the pixels get smaller and smaller. As they get smaller and smaller, they collect less light, and so they become more noisy. Uh, and I that's, use dark soft technology. Well, that's, <laughs> that, that's why the panel is where people invent lots of great technology that mitigates some of the challenges. But there's a huge amount that goes on even before a JPEG is created, and then. <coughs> yeah, I, I just wanted to add from a, a you know an OEM perspective. I mean, the way we take a look at uh, digital imaging and, and video, uh, certainly um, there is the image signal processor, which uh, Oliver had uh, referenced. The uh, the sensor, uh, the uh, optics. I'm sure you've seen some videos <coughs> advertised, you know, with Carl Zeiss lenses and such. So that's you know the the basic hardware level, and then. Uh, the next level that at least ZTE we look at in terms of uh, the software layer uh, before um, you know the user actually takes the photo is very basic things like autofocus, auto uh, white balance, and um, uh, auto contrast. And then on top of that is you know once you've got the image to process it for like. Uh, uh, facial recognition or smile detection, etc. And then on top of that, the, the application layer where you have, you know, your Facebook or your Instagram, etc. So, uh, and all the different OEMs are trying to differentiate and, uh, and uh, improve uh, the photo and video experience because it is one of the major use cases of a smartphone these days, you know? And so, uh, so yeah, it's, uh, I think we're going to see a lot of exciting things in the, in the coming years as more and more people are even more dependent on their uh, smartphones for, for capturing uh, photos and videos. Uh, yeah, just, oh, I was just going to add that there's a trend that we're beginning to see that people are adding more analytics into the hardware layer, lower down, because if you use face tracking, you can do it in software, but maybe you can track one person if you do it in software, and your battery will be challenged. Whereas if you put it in hardware, you can track maybe 20 people, and then you can also do more sophisticated analytics. So we, we begin to see more and more of the analytics moving into hardware where you can increase the performance. It's also because now the CPUs and the GPUs are much bigger. I mean, it used to be you had a pretty dumb device in your hands. So trying to make it do anything, you probably <coughs> not do it or die. What I was going to say was that what we do is sort of between the facial recognition and the sharing. So it's how the user experiences the actual photo. And what we believe is that their experience with the photo has a lot to do with, um, with, with the, the emotion right that they're, they're, they're trying to express. And so um, we want to simplify all of that really complex processing down to sort of very intuitive um, tools and very intuitive gestures on the phone itself. And so, you know, you asked earlier if it's sort of in the cloud and whatnot. It, you know, that will vary based on which technology you're using. Uh, what we do is is all of the the processors are downloaded onto the device, um, and then the user has a has, has a very intuitive interface to sort of uh, uh, play with those processors. And and before they share it, you know, we can do a bunch. This is sort of where the controversial comment might come in, but we can do a bunch of stuff 
automatically or automatically to a photo. Um, but what the user is really going to enjoy is actually playing with the photo themselves. And so it's taking that really complicated uh, technology, putting it into an interface that anyone can understand, and, and giving them ownership over what that photo looks like ultimately, that really drives the user engagement. I think there's an evolution, right? Because our expectations of what our devices should do and what we want to do with them exceed the, the actual hardware, like always. It's always a race to the better. <laughs> we always want more than what we can do, no matter how much we can do. So I think there used to be, if you wanted anything done, it had to be done on the server side because you had nothing on the device. Now our devices are smarter and smarter. They're more and more powerful, right? The computers inside of our smartphones are more and more powerful and inside of our cameras as well, right? But what we want to do is still much more, uh, much more complex than what's possible on a portable, battery-powered device. So I, I think it's really interesting. You'll see like the most popular technologies will start on the server side, and with some latency and some give and take on bandwidth and all these issues. And then as soon as they get popular enough, and as the smartphones start catching up, you'll see part of it being offloaded on the device itself. But then we'll want something else. <laughs> but also, so I think it's all—it's always kind of like a relay between, and that's really what's interesting about the whole segmentation of the smartphone business is there's so many devices to support on so many carriers and so many diverse environments that the the actual relay between the the hardware and the server is mm -hmm. an increasing challenge. Yeah, I totally agree. Like nowadays, the devices are getting smarter and smarter with the development of CPU and GPU, probably like APU together. But why we want to keep our technology in the cloud? Because we want to serve a more broad audience, where people probably people always thinking computer vision scientists. They like study for several years. They start doing like visual recognition kind of things. Even like Google and Facebook recently got a lot of talents acquisition and so forth but we do think except for those big products there are definitely a lot of areas where this technology can play a role in and increase user experience and that's the reason why we want to like uh, keep our technology in the cloud we offer different package of SDK for <coughs> like developers easy to use we have SDK for iOS Android even for Google Glass PHP all type of thing <coughs> So that for some lightweighted customer, they can directly grab the things instead of hiring some PhDs, start from scratch. They can directly use our technology. And more sweet is by process in the cloud. Actually, with nowadays the computer powers increase, it doesn't people do not really feel the latencies. And also we are using like deep learning, like machine learning algorithm. The sweet part is by every time we process new images every day, the smart uh, the our engine actually getting smarter and smarter, the accuracy is keep improving. And that thing kind of puts the whole industry to move forward, have a better actually rather than we like doing customization for like one type of devices and we spend another three months for like customization for another and other devices and not as a whole like pushing ours if, um, to be performed better and one thing we uh, since we opened our API like August 2012 we do see the benefits because nowadays we're processing more than 3 million images every day and our performance was keep increasing increasing much better than some like hardware devices and that is why we think um, for some type of task, it may be good for hard devices, but the whole society kind of improving technology is better to have something in the cloud. Everybody can use that. Well, I think it really depends on the particular use case. Obviously, you can do more in, in the cloud, but uh, from my experience, um, I've had experience uh, Yahoo Photos and um, Adobe that a lot of people, you know, they take a lot of photos mm -hmm. and then they don't do much with it, right? So it's a matter of you know, on device trying to manage um, the um, photos or do uh, basic photos um, uh, editing on, on their particular device. So certainly having intelligence in the cloud and then um, and uh, processing the photos maybe on the device could be, uh, you know, a use case that, that, that we see or a lot of people, or, or automatically, you know, uploading photos to your, wherever your final uh, master storage uh, location is or it could be a hybrid, it's still, you know, we kind of still live in a, a mixed uh, photo video environment where we take some photos with um, our camera, more important photos, I think, uh, such as uh, events and ceremonies with a digital uh, DSLR or even a, uh, a still for optical zoom, et cetera, and then maybe um, for a camcorder for like a, a wedding or something really special, special 
uh, event. So, um, so yeah, um, I think you know you're going to have to have intelligence at, at all levels. Yeah. One of the, sorry, one of the things that we struggle with, and I'm curious to hear hear all your thoughts is. Um, is really offering that technology to the masses. So, you know, only a very small percentage of, of phones have, uh, phones specifically have, um, you know, CPUs and GPUs that are advanced enough to, to process the types of things that we're asking them to do. Um, and so what do we do with the rest of the world that wants to be creative, wants to take photos, wants to do interesting and unique things with, you know, with facial recognition and all that, but with devices that aren't powerful enough? So we struggle with how we get really mass adoption without having cell phones um, be able to, to do the things that we're asking them to do. Yeah. I, mean, I, I think it really depends on the algorithm. I mean, if you talk about the face recognition algorithm that's fixing the, the focus and the metering, well, that's got to run in the phone because if it doesn't get it right, your picture's out of focus. You know, so there are some algorithms that have to run in real time and have to run as fast as possible in the phone. There are others that quite happily can run in the cloud. Can, can I run all that stuff on, a, say, a Series 60? That's <laughs> 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 you know, circa like, like, what, 2007? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, yeah. <laughs> you actually can. The man over there may know. They may have had some hardware to do it back then. Yeah. Or a fixed focus yeah. is probably... Most of the older cameras were fixed focus. Yeah, because, like, probably a good majority of the world still in emerging markets have feature phones. And so they're not there. So a lot of stuff is going to have to be leveraged in the cloud. I mean, just like, I mean, you can still do the face tagging and yeah. that Facebook does, right? And with a Motorola Razor. Yeah. I mean, if you don't have an autofocus camera, you have a fixed focus, you kind of solve that problem of having to focus on the subject. Cool. Um, so let's talk about um, cool applications. So what's, 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 what have you seen today that that a not with because we're going to talk about creepy after that. <laughs> so don't talk about creepy yet. So let's look at something that's cool that, that you think that hey, well, this is awesome. This is very cool. I like it. It's a good application of of intelligent imaging. Um, do you have a favorite? Have, have you seen what, what have you seen in the marketplace? Start with you. Yeah, if start with me, it's like instead of seeing like something I like saw and things really mm -hmm. cool, and it is one thing we build, we think it's really cool. Uh, for demo purpose only right now it's more like the magic mirror which we use a real-time face recognition kind of algorithm to like give you the recommendation probably which angle is the most beautiful angle for you to take especially for me like Asian girls right we like we do take a lot of Photoshop and later on we can cover different user experience right I almost try like 10 different like 10 minutes like finding the optimal selfie yeah we have that already long Asia Pacific and we receive like how high volumes because people also they want to decorate themselves with different cosmetics different like hairstyle they want to check even before they step out to like the social events they want to know oh, whether I look good today or they want to decorate as a kind of celebrity they want to look like and they like decorate follow the steps on the website and then they check it out this is very interesting even though some people are talking about like beauty score kind of like very sensitive score, but it's definitely can use in a lot of ways. For example, for some of the cosmetics company or some more like close environment, it helps people to like compare it before whether you had makeup or after your makeup, probably both the age and beauty score will change. And also for some guys, I think they may like this feature kind of such capability, you can solve through Will the potential dating. Yeah. <laughs> Which one do I look more macho in? What's my <laughs> probably, probably for guys, not that way. But if you go to some dating sites, you probably want some kind of premium feature you can source through the candidate by how beautiful they're looking at as a secret feature. Actually, it's really funny. Um, we, about a year ago, we were analyzing what our most used tools were, and you could probably guess there were things like effects and tilt shift and color splash yeah. that you were seeing everywhere. In the last six months, I think the second or maybe even the most popular tool in our toolkit was blemish removal. <laughs> so you can actually see this emergence of selfies in the in, in the tool usage that we're getting. We're not a, we're not a <laughs> selfie. The word yet. of the year, right? Yeah, um, 2013. Yeah. And the funny thing is, it actually came when if we analyzed our Asian markets last year. 
the blemish removal tool was really popular there, and now it's in America too. So we're 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 seeing these trends come from. Not just in Asia. I mean, Perfect 365 got 20 million downloads. Most of them are in the U.S. So I think we're on the same. Yeah, way. exactly. Because I'm mentioning that because a lot of people are talking about facial recognition, kind of like all think it's creepy stuff, like related to privacy. It's exactly not always that like that. Some like the fun features, like beauty score, the age reader, kind of also the emotion tracking help the uh, the like the companies can engage with customer, a lot of like a lightweight um, application and software can be help people to like improve their user experience well, like for their daily life. That is why, as we mentioned, we want people to be more creative, use such, such kind of technology, building something really cool and really fun just to change their own life or a friend's life to change their socialization with people. All right, what have you seen lately? So now I'm kind of a video guy, so it has to be a 4K TV, and, and not, not necessarily for 4K images, although 4K video, I think that that is amazing when you see it. If you guys haven't seen it, go to Best Buy and look at the TVs. Do they actually have demos? Like, yeah, they do. Show the 4K they, do. Stuff. they have a Sony, and they have Samsung, and, and a few others. But, you know, a four, uh, for those that don't know, uh, a 4K TV is, is exactly four times the pixels of a 1080p. <laughs> So it's 2160p, so 2160 by uh, 1920, so exactly four times. But one of the cool applications that I don't think people are talking about is still image. So if you, if you do the maps, that's 8 million pixels. So any camera that takes that 8 million pixels, you can see one for one on a 4K TV, and it's going to look absolutely amazing. You know, typically if you look at a 1080p, you're doing a, a 4x subsampling reducing the image quality by 4x. The other thing with these new TVs is that they're actually having a wider gamut. Now that means that it can display a wider range of colors. They also have much higher brightness and much bigger dynamic range. And so when you put all of that together, you get an image experience which to me is just like the one from standard F to HD. And, and that's why I think 4K is going to be huge. I have a quick question on, okay, so all these are LED, right? So you go to the store, you see an LED, but yeah. how does that differ from the screens that I get on my mobile device? So LED actually refers to the backlight. It doesn't refer to the actual transistors that are used mm -hmm. to make the image. And the, basically there's fluorescent <coughs> which is the older style, and now there's LED. And the, the benefits of LED is that you can more localize, control the backlight, and so you get a wider dynamic range. But there's actually now a step beyond that that, that Dolby is promoting and others, which Dolby calls Dolby Vision, which is a technology where you have, instead of just the backlight at the edges, you have it localized. And so by having the ability to control the backlight in 300 or so more localized areas, you can have much wider dynamic ranges. The images basically look a lot better. You get much darker blacks, much brighter highlights, and it looks like an HDR photo, and that's what your TV will do. So, you know, most every TV that everyone has today actually shows only a third of the colors that our eyes can see. That's all that TVs today can show. The newer TVs will get closer to the reality. And if you don't believe me, look at strawberries. Strawberries do not look correct on TVs today because the red is outside of the gamut that today's TVs can display. So how does that affect John though? When John's shopping for a vendor for LCD screen, or not LCD screens, but the next generation of screens, well, what is the? I mean, button? of course, component cost. I mean, a lot of our handsets are um, sold uh, on the low to medium end, but on the high end, you know, obviously there's screens that we source from uh, Sharp or Corning or uh, well, the glass and then the, the LCD. Uh, one of the things that I did want to comment was that uh, in, in terms of 4K, a lot of people um, are wondering what the content is going to be uh, out there. But uh, the smartphone will actually probably be the first uh, generator of 4K content out there because uh, in your latest Qualcomm Snapdragon 800 series phones, they have the ability to uh, capture and encode 4K um, video. Uh, and so from that aspect, your home movies, uh, should you want to take them in 4K, are going to be in 4K and you'll be able to view it on, on your TV. So uh, from that perspective, you know, 
uh, what you have in your hands um, in the next year, you're going to be able to really um, uh, take the highest quality video uh, out there. Of course, I mean, there are other things that matter, as I mentioned, in terms of uh, the sensor itself and the, the optics, but that's, you know, I think really uh, something that uh, I think the OEMs are going to push, as well as uh, certainly Qualcomm, since they're, they're, they're uh, highlighting that future, future quite a bit. Uh, one other thing that I did want to, to mention in terms of cool applications <coughs> or, or hardware, since I'm speaking, um, that uh, also at a uh, at a um, event um, a conference that I saw uh, had attended, there was uh, you know a company providing a, a new sensor to be able to capture the um, the uh, distance in terms of light. So uh, being able to uh, uh, take a photo and then basically, if you've ever used Photoshop, you know, have layers of images where if you have people in a row, you can literally, you know, not have to um, Photoshop each layer to separate the people, but basically composite an image so that um, this whole audience, I could remove the first row from the second row, from the third row to the fourth row, where distance is captured in each image pixel. And I think that will provide a lot of um, interesting uh, aspects. One, I mean, probably better, um, uh, um, I think, uh, focus. Um, I mean, it really reminded me of uh, this company called Lightro, which got a lot of press about it a year or two ago, where it's capturing all the uh, uh, light and distance and being able to refocus uh, any photo after the fact, because it's capturing all the information. So. Uh, so, yeah, the, the last thing I wanted to mention in terms of uh, interesting feature, we've talked about, uh, you know, selfies. Uh, this past, uh, at CES, we, we launched or announced some new phones, and one of the features that uh, we added in terms of uh, image capture was, you know, when you're taking a selfie, it's kind of hard to, like, hold the balance and take the photo, so we added a voice recognition to be able to say, take photo, you know, and so that's, like, kind of a no-brainer when you think about it after the fact. Uh, that, that's pretty. That's a good idea, and I, I think we're going to definitely see that uh, roll out in all phones in the, in the future. Well, yeah, Caroline, go. What's your what cool app that you've seen? I think I agree with both of them. I mean, what's really interesting is how much closer we're getting to the human experience, right? I mean, all of this is just another way to get us closer, right? Closer to what our eyes see, closer closer to what we interpret when we see something, right? When you, it's not, we're not just optics, right? It's also what we think when we, when we see somebody, right? It's we see ourselves when we take our own photo. And I think what's really interesting is not just the fact that we're getting closer to the human experience, but also the fact that we're changing the human experience, right? Selfie is a word of the year. <laughs> so what's really interesting to me as a photographer about that is that you used to be the victim of other people's photos. I'm sure we all have had that experience where your parents were taking a photo of you and you hate it, and they just want to show all their friends. That's the photo of you that's official forever, you know, that photo of you at two years old, probably eating something you shouldn't. Um, where I, I think there's a new generation of people now that are taking a lot more control, right? With the selfie, you're taking a photo of yourself, you're in full control of how people look at you. So even though, let's say, there's at least two or three different types of lights in this room, and it's pretty dark, I could take a picture of myself, process it with either Perfect 365 or other soft technology, because I have a little plug in there, and then share it in a way that makes me look somewhat professional, right? So I don't look like, so my Facebook photo is the best, which is really the most important thing. Um, but yeah, so I think what's really interesting is that we're moving back to where it used to be very showy imaging technology, right? HDR, where like scenes look like they're from Mars, all the way now to things that are invisible. The best technologies are the ones that you don't really notice anymore, right? You take a picture, you expect it to look good or you expect it to look very close to what you see. And that is actually an incredible feat of technology. And what's really exciting is that we're getting closer and closer to that actual, you know, real time, what I see is what I get. Uh, so, I actually, one of the things that I was gonna say when you first asked the question, John stole from me, which is the uh, the ability to capture the you know distance and images, because that's something that, as a photo editor, um, as a technology that's, that's enabling photo editing, something that we're going to, to have to build for. Um, but you know, a new answer is actually something that many of you are going to think are creepy, um, but I actually think it's cool, and it's, um, it's, it's how people are trying to start monetizing 
this sort of technology. So maybe not monetizing so much as um, using it for monetization. Uh, and what I mean by that is, you know, we can start using recognition to say, you know, it's a picture of a can of Coke. I want to go buy a can of Coke. Right? It's going to know, and I can click, and it's going to take me to Amazon, um, and I can buy it. But more than that is, is some of the stuff we were talking about earlier, which is you walk by a billboard and there's a camera in the billboard and it'll see your face, it'll know who you are, and it'll retarget to you. Um, so some stuff that actually is quite creepy, but actually personalizing your experience as you walk down the street, to me, is, is, is pretty interesting. That, that use case is actually live in the UK at Tesco, a gas station. Uh, they actually do have now cameras in, in London that are looking at people's faces and figuring out what demographic, male, female, what mm -hmm. age group, and serving different video ads depending on who they recognize. I was really right. curious about that because I'm always such a fascinating case of not being a female. <laughs> so if you, if you were just to take my face and try to figure out, maybe you'd show me kittens or something. Yeah. And here I am, you know, I'm a like, competitive sailor, I love the UFC. How do you get from <coughs> just seeing a face and being able to target, I mean, it's all about relevance, yeah. right? Like you show me a pink skirt or a kitty and I'll just move on. <laughs> Well, I think yeah. it's, it's actually going to get to targeting you specifically. So it'll find your face. That's creepy. Yeah. <laughs> it'll find your face. It'll match it to your face on Facebook. It'll know, you know the things you like on Facebook. It might be able to go look at you know, your Amazon history. You know, we, we all know about cookie tracking and that kind of thing. And then it'll retarget. The same way that Amazon retargets to you when you go read the Huffington Post, it'll start retargeting you when you're walking down. You know, Caroline, you'll, you'll see it working when like laser twos are promoted to you now. <laughs> That's when you know it's working. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, this is so minority report. I mean, what, what was that? 2001, 2002, that, that movie? Mm -hmm. but yeah. That's actually now happening. Yeah, exactly. As for us, we also have several partners who do the similar thing, kind of direct the, the interactive contents based on who you are. But one more interesting we figure out is not only to faces. This is just to a certain level of understanding, as we currently just mentioned. The other thing we figure out is pretty interesting by understand what these people's daily lives are. For example, like concept recognition or object and things. For example, for me, for on my Facebook, I'm always every day uploading my food photos. Everywhere I go, I take pictures of the food kind of thing. It's more like the gallery of all kinds of delicious food on my Facebook. It's better to get the understanding not only from my personal perspective, but also like what things I'm more interested in. Whether I'm always taking photos on the seashore, like hanging out with friends, or I'm the type of person always hang out in the like bars, like dancing there. It's actually more and more targeting and information can be delivered based on both face, who you are, some geometry, like how old are you, Asian or like female, male kind of thing, but also some like data we were gathering from the everyday, like everyday life. For some of the pictures on your phones, or some pictures shared on the social networks, for example, your Pinterest channel. By the time we know what your interest is, it's better like more targeting to deliver certain contents. Yeah, and I mean, these phones, we all have more and more sensors, so you know the location, you know the time. I mean, in the future, you could know, like, with accelerometer, whether or not you're driving to and from, Google Calendar, I mean, I think Google with Google Plus and trying to build more intelligence into, I think, uh, exactly. Auto Awesome, or I think that's the future, you know, trying to provide more context to the, to the, to the photo or video um, um, outside the, the image. It's just going to be, you know, I think the, the holy grail, at least for, I think for me, for personal use would be to able to auto-categorize and index all my photos without having to, you know, do anything, right? I mean, no one loves sorting their photos or organizing them or backing them up, and to have all that intelligence to be able to do all of that um, automatically um, is, I think, you know, <coughs> happening in the future. It's pretty cool. You can like try to imagine if you are able to like sort through like tens of thousands of your photos on your phone and easily pull up every photo of your adorable dog and show it to your friends. Or like by some like concept recognition on top of that, you can easily just by a swap of finger pull up those photos with your dog uh, on a Sunday walking a park. It's more like instant re arrangement of those information you have. It helps a lot when people survive from the huge number of multimedia contents. So um, let's talk about creepy. So what I, I mean, there would be a nice app. I'd love, you know. Okay, so everyone, if this was a world of glass or wearables, so everyone had 
um, Oliver's next generation of. I'm already got them. He has already got them. He's, he's wearing them. So, but um, if we were all wearing glasses, then we could walk up to somebody and say, like, "Hey, ye," you know, basically, because a lot of times at social networking events, we don't know who was that person in front of me. Who did I just walk to? So, in this environment, would that be creepy to everybody? I'd love that. Well, or how many people would love that idea? Right, so you you show up and you get and you I can I'll rent you a, 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 you know some glasses and you guys can wear it and you guys can see each other and kind of know who everyone is. So that would be cool, right? But as long as the glasses look cool. I'm yeah. sorry, <laughs> the ones today I'm not wearing. No, they're only gonna look like those 3D glasses that you got the movie theater. <laughs> but um, but then how about then you're at the mall and then their sales associates are wearing the glass uh, and they're going, hey Bob, what's going on? And you don't even know who this person is. Now he's got the contact. He's up there. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's exactly. very contact. That yeah. the same thing. So how uh, would that be creepy to everybody? Yeah. Okay. Um, so <laughs> let's let's talk about creepy. <laughs> what, what have you seen lately? That's kind of like wow. That's a little too a little maybe a little too a little bit beyond my my comfort for privacy. Wow, that's getting personal. <laughs> My personal privacy. No, I, I think it's all, I mean, you've identified the core of the problem, right? Which is, it's context dependent. Yeah. In this room right now, just with these people for a limited amount of time, as soon as we get out, I don't know you, that's fine. Um, but it's really, you don't really need futuristic wearables to get to that point. I mean, just with smartphones and all of tra tracking capabilities on what you're doing every day, you know a lot about somebody. But it's always the, the balance. What is the balance of what you're willing to give to any company in terms of data about you versus what you're going to get? Would it be really cool if somebody knew that I was about to get really sick and give me medicine to my door by the time I got the fever? That would be awesome. Am I willing to let anybody know all of that about me? Hell no. So and it, what's really interesting, I think, is that the, the, the balance of how much we're willing to give in order, in order to get more is increasing. Or the, the target use case where someone was pregnant. Oh. And I was, that was right. creepy. And then That's she, she was, creepy. Because I'm not creepy. And I'm pregnant. And then she's like, oh, but yes, yeah, I am. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think in this day and age, if you put something on the internet, then people can discover it. So. Well, if you're using a device that ha that is internet enabled, which is pretty much everything, including your car, yeah. you're cool with somebody like knowing about that. If I choose, I mean, I should have the option to. Opt but I mean, you left somewhere where you like you can't use the device unless you sign <laughs> but, it. But I think I think okay, who has who doesn't have a Facebook account in this room? Wow. <laughs> I knew Joe was gonna. Yeah, I knew that okay, too. So there's a couple of people in this room, and I and I know probably there's a really good reason why. Um, for the rest of us, you know, I think if you look at the terms of service at Facebook, yeah, they, we've basically given up a lot of our privacy, a lot of our, bi you know, biometric information and, and other personal Google's stuff. just as bad. Right? <laughs> and Google probably yeah, just, just as bad, right? I'm sure the um, NSA is worse. You know, with Picasa and all the image stuff. But then I think Flickr, though, I mean, Flickr has a little interesting terms of service if you, if you um, actually read it. Yeah, it's, it's, it, I think you kind of have the ownership. You really can't. They can't do well because if you're, if say you're a professional photographer. So, so mo most of, most of the stuff doesn't creep me out at all, right? Like I don't, I don't care if someone knows I'm gonna get sick. Well, what creeps me out is, you know, with like facial recognition and things that are coming out now, when they can detect my mood. So there's some things that, you know, if if Google Glass got good enough to know if I was happy or sad, even if I was trying to be one or the other. That's when it would No, there's good. a wearable for that. <laughs> what about detecting if you're lying? Like, like, with, like with, a real I mean, you could see a real app where you can tell by micro expressions if someone's lying. Is that going too far? Not if you work at the police station. <laughs> <laughs> where some situation, probably your Google Glass recognize you as a Facebook <coughs> and pull all your timeline events, and then you start talking with a new person, like hiding up something, like say, okay, uh, I didn't reply you because last week I went to France, some blah, blah, anything. But the person like instantly recognize who you are and pull you all your life events on different like social networks and keep tracking, oh, you are lying to me. You actually like have birthday party with Amy like, yesterday. So that's kind of creepy by recognize who you are, but more like connecting with the social information around, yeah. I, I think if you opt in, I think that's the option. Yeah, everyone should have the option to opt in. If you opt but in, opt into what? I mean, 
you're going to use my information, but I can't predict what it's going to be used for a month or two months or two years or five years from now, right? That's, that's the issue is I have a lot of imagination that can be used for the greatest thing or the worst thing. I, I think what, you either give the information or you don't. I think mean, that's the simple... You that's, either like, let, that's like writing a blank check. Here's a blank check. Maybe you'll write... But there's also, I mean, on the if you're wearing glass, obviously if I'm wearing glass, I'm seeing everybody in here. So the people in the audience wouldn't necessarily be opting in. So. Um, you know, there have been stories about people trying to, you know, wear makeup or change their faces or uh, certainly I know people actually uh, not putting a photo on Facebook for their profile photo because that's how Facebook is going to recognize and tag your, your, uh, all of your photos. So are we all going to be around with anonymous face masks? So probably against the terms of service of Facebook, I'm guessing, <laughs> not yet, but it might be in the future. Put a cat photo, you'll be safe. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I wanted to close the, the discussion a little bit on video, because I think Oliver you know, gave us a really good background. But let's let's talk about how many megapixels is too much. What is At what, at what point is it like, wow, that, because I, I've already seen the 4K stuff, it looks a little, a little off. It doesn't, it, I wasn't used to it, and it looks like there's, it's skipping a few frames, it just looks a little odd. So that answer really depends about what are you doing with the image. I mean, if you're printing a tiny little image, then, you know, probably a million pixels is, is fine. If you want to print a massive image, or if you want to have something very, very <coughs> high flyer. Sure. Uh, but you know, the, the key with, with 4K is that, you know, it's, it's to do with the size of the screen and the distance. So if you have a very small screen, a very small TV, and you sit a long way away, you won't see any difference. You might source just buy a standard FTV, depending on how small your screen is and how far away. As you get closer to the screen, or as the screen gets bigger, then resolution really matters. And what people really want is the immersive experience, where you have a very big screen, ideally the whole wall. And so you see images that are life-size, and at that, you're very, very close, and you need a lot of resolution. So the Japanese are actually pushing for 8K. They feel 4K is not good enough, <coughs> and, and that's four times bigger. And what's that? Going to be a screen this size, right? Everyone, every home is going to have a screen this big, right? I, I believe this they, is the future. Actually, I think that's. I mean, Sony at CES at their, their keynote, they showed a what they call a short throw projector. It's a projector that's about one foot from the screen. We put up, uh, I believe from memory, a 168-inch 4K image. Yeah. Now it's thirty to forty thousand dollars right now. But in ten years' time, yeah, people will buy that, and they will dedicate a whole wall as their screen. And you will look at content, and I think the ultimate goal is that you can't tell that it's video. It's just looking like a, a window. And we will get there. But how many pixels? Probably 16 k is going to be. It's going to be like to back, and back to the Future. Remember Back to the Future Three? He goes and, he's, and they have the screen and they change that. <laughs> yeah, that, that, I mean that is going to come within you know 20 years. I think we will be there. Cool. Um, so I wanted to go. VJ had some good questions. Um, I wanted to cover some of those. Um, and 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 more about. So, how do we look at you know complex technology and and make it adoptable for the masses? So we're looking at I think uh, E at RBS, everything's in the cloud. People submit basically post-process images, videos, etc. Um, and then I think on our kind of the ArcSoft solution is a mix of both. For some solutions, you can do it do it locally and also send out to the cloud. And VJ, I think you guys do something very similar to that as well. Um, so what is uh, essentially the, how are we going to make this mainstream, I think? Mean, is it just through the applications that we inter that we're exposed to on a daily basis? Or how, Going to? How, or, basically, or basically how is the audience or the general public going to be exposed to a lot of these different technologies? And then, um, and also, um, you know, how are they going to get also access to the to, to gesture recognition? How is, so what does that future look like? Yeah, I, I touched on some of this stuff earlier when I was when I was talking, but that, that's one of the things we struggle with. Right? It's taking relatively complex things and 
putting them down to a format and a function that is usable and is digestible for the masses, where people that might not have ever experienced image editing, people that might not have ever experienced recognition, and trying to make the interface really intuitive. Um, <clears throat> so I don't, I don't have an answer for that. Uh, but you know, we do things like, uh, you know, for for people in in emerging in emerging markets, where right, we might downsize the image. Uh, on the device and have the user edit on a downsized image so it happens more instantaneously and then when the, once they hit save it'll then shoot it back um, and we'll do the rest of the processing on the cloud when they can take you know, 30 seconds or a minute to do it. Uh, so we, we do things like that to try to make some of this processing more um, more accessible uh, but you know it's something that, that we definitely struggle with. Right? We, we built a product for the US and for and for you know developed markets and, and, and how, how do we you know, and in our, in our processing and our technology isn't even that complex. So <clears throat> I'm curious, you know, people like Morbius, what, what do you do to, to try to get folks that aren't used to that sort of technology and might not have all the processing available uh, to handle it? How, how do you deal with that? So in current state, we're still like improving the user experiences, especially for developers, how they're getting easier and easier to adopt our technology. Current status, we're more use a standard solution. We offer RESTful API, which is a pretty standard format. A lot of people, a lot of developers can easily start using that. And also we give different wrappers for like iOS SDK, Android SDK, PHP, and even Google Plus. And on, in the meanwhile, we also build some like demonstration applications and then uh, draw some people's interest level and after that we also open all the source code in GitHub so people can step, uh, start like from learning uh, step by step how the application level thing integrated with the API kind of thing. We have some tutorials, very good, well documented like API document. It's currently what we do and definitely a lot of things can be done and we need to improve it more and more get engaged with people. Yeah, I think you've hit on the point, right? So if you only do server-side, you're limited by what the device can do. So I think that's an advantage we've seen. Our software except the chip level. So when you, go, when you go all the way down the metal and you're optimizing from the chip, from the capture moment where you have full control at the capture moment and really optimize for that particular device, right? How all the parts interact with each other then you have a chance of having the best experience from the start, right? Because otherwise you're just handed something and then you're trying to make the best out of it. Whereas if you're starting from the, the captured time, you have first an opportunity at the capture level, right, with great manufacturers to work with them on optimizing that experience before you pass it on to the server for the maximum supercomputer experience and then come back down. But you don't really have a choice. You either have an approach where you're doing the best with what you have or you work all the way back up and really try to look at Technologies you can improve on every possible array of devices, from the chip all the way back to the server. I'd just like to add, I mean, at the end, you really need to think about who your target user is in the user experience. Um, when I was at Adobe, you know, everybody was asking me for, you know, employee discount copies of Photoshop. And it's like, really, do you want Photoshop? Do you know how complex Photoshop is? And so I would say, how about Photoshop Elements, which, you know, was uh, kind of the prosumer, consumer version, which was a simplified menu, less features, obviously it wasn't going to cannibalize Photoshop. <laughs> but I mean, for most people, uh, out there, Photoshop Elements was way more than they needed. They only thought of Photoshop because of the brand, but really Photoshop is a, a, a professional's tool. Um, and then when I was at Yahoo Photos, that was a very, very mainstream service where um, you know people basically just upload to albums and then ordered prints. So really think about the, 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 the user flow and what your audience is around there. I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why you know an Instagram is popular because of you know it does what people want to do and very easily. So. Yeah, on that note, you know one of the things that we do to, to get it out to the masses is sometimes introduce photo editing in a um, in an experience where you might not, you might not be used to seeing it. So you, photos are now ubiquitous. Uh, you can use it for commerce, you use it for messaging, you use it for content, really everywhere you go you'll see photos and so the reason we built an SDK and we were founded on that is 
uh, is now you can easily get that sort of technology in all of those places. So if you're selling an item, you can quickly edit that image before you before you post it on eBay or, or, or what have you. If you're if you're messaging something to your friend, you can take a picture and edit it very quickly before you um, before you send it. So. What we're trying to do is, is consolidate all the experiences so really all the people that might not even think to, to use this sort of technology can actually get access to it really anywhere they go. Cool. I have one, one glass question left. <laughs> and that's more about what is kind of the future of glass. I know right now it's a novelty. I have a pair. I had a pair for a month and I'm still trying to figure it out. It won't let me wear it in the house. Uh, so, kind of, what is what is the uh, what is the future evolution of glass? I mean, how is that going to really impact in, in intelligent imaging? Because I, I think we kind of already know today kind of where that's going to go. But you know, what do you uh, have all of you have yeah, I, I'm I'm not optimistic. I, I I just think that it's right now most people, normal people, won't wear something that looks that ugly. If you could, if you can bury it into a regular pair of glasses and you can't tell, absolutely. But we're a way off from getting to that point. How about if I flip it over and it's in your car? So now your car, because like Honda's got like eight yeah. cameras in the car. Yeah. If you guys remember that, it's like sleep cameras all is, over the place. Well, I think all new cars are going yeah. to have a camera for sleep detection. If your eyes shut, it will wake you up. <laughs> yeah. Or distraction, because that already exists, right? The fact that you're not looking where you should be, let's say you're looking down at something. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of looking at the or, or a heads-up display on the windscreen. Yeah, and also some customized solutions based on profile who you are. If you are the driver, like the main driver, will customize with the temperature, music, and all different settings. Interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, my opinion on glass is that uh, if it is successful, it's going to take off in vertical markets in terms of Field sales, field yeah. service, things like that. Yeah, I could see um, early on. I, I, so I used to be an aerospace engineer a long time ago, and I could definitely see crawling inside a wing. And I don't want to crawl into outside to get the manual. <laughs> I could already, I could already see Air Force and stuff like that using using this that that type of hardware. Mm -hmm. Not not per se the Google solution, but some type of solution that is e easily brings up data um, when you're maybe in a confined space or don't or you're multitasking. And I think we can all agree that the, the form factor as it exists today probably isn't ideal, um, as, as, we all, as we all admitted, you know, maybe if it was embedded in a normal, normal, normal pair of glasses, but we're not going to let go of the technology, right? It's going to exist, we're going to make it succeed, and there's, there's obviously all these vertical integrations uh, that'll have pretty incredible use cases um, that, that I think are really going to be the drivers of that success. Cool. Well, um, I want to open it up to Q and A. Okay, you guys want to? You guys ready? This <laughs> for the audience. Okay, who has a question from the audience? Okay. 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 Just state your name and the question, not a statement. Question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Igorti from uh, Samsung, Android engineer. Um, what metadata can we extract from the device camera and sensors that can make us power intelligent apps or s solutions? From the devices, because there could be I mean, even doing simple things like searching for photos is a mighty challenge on the devices. That's up to you guys. I mean, as you know, I don't need to tell you at least that exit data is not standardized. I mean, that's the biggest problem. So there's no standardization, and therefore all the fields are in different places, and whatever you want to put is un unreadable to 90 percent, 99 percent of applications. So some of it has to to do. I think there's a lot we could do. Um, from an outside a metadata, right, the data around the image taking, that would be very useful to many applications, who's in it, where it is, all that stuff, but who's going to do that and how are we going to standardize it needs to happen before we can do anything with it. And just to add, th there's an opportunity here because uh, the new video standard H.265 actually has a still profile, it's called main still profile, which is twice as efficient as JPEG. Um, and that's why the video guys defined it, and now the JPEG guys are running with it. But there's now an opportunity maybe to standardize that metadata as we come up with a replacement for, for JPEG. Hi, uh, I'm Roger, and I wanted to ask about the 4K discussion that you had before. 3D for um, consumer personal devices didn't really take off. Is there a risk that 4K will go the same route? Uh, route? Of course there's a risk, but I personally don't think so. I, I think, again, most consumers didn't want to have to wear glasses, and the, uh, the technology where you didn't wear glasses didn't really work so well. 
Uh, I, I think if you go into a retailer and look at a 4K TV with some good 4K content, to me it is, is a wow factor. And, and so that's why I think it will take off. The other factor is that the costs are not very large for the manufacturers. It's really, when they make the glass, um, it's not that much more expensive. It's just the driver electronics. So I think the combination of it having a wow factor and it won't necessarily cost that much more. You can already buy a 50-inch 4K TV uh, from Vizio for a f under a thousand dollars today. And I think one of the points that you made too earlier was that the problem, one of the problems with 3D TVs is that it in forced people into taking, capturing in 3D. So there was all this content that you couldn't reuse that had to be remade from scratch. And that's a huge amount of cost for a lot of people, right? So yeah. it's a problem of the chicken of the egg of like, is the content appealing enough? Is there enough of it? Yeah. It's, and is there enough demand for to create the content that people might want to pay for versus you know making something closer to the eye where you may not have to upgrade everything in order for it to work? Yeah, and ju just to add, I mean, any professional content today, whether it's a movie or a high-end TV show, it's been shot in 4K already. I mean, I think the real challenge, though, is the transmission of that data in terms of uh, satellite or, or cable or over the internet. It's, uh, yeah, the yeah, bandwidth that... issue. And certainly you're not going to stream 4K uh, over your wireless connection, even if you do have uh, LTE. So You could maybe like if it's like this big. Uh, so, <laughs> so that's where the new compression standard that my company's working on, H.265 or HEVC, comes in. So at CES, Netflix publicly said that they will stream 4K shows at 16 megabits a second and at 12. Uh, and that's 4K at 24 frames a second. And, and, and that's obviously you know, significantly less half the bit rate or more of if they had used the older H.264. Uh, yes, John Ostrom. Uh, my question is, you know, one size isn't going to fit everything. So I'm interested about machine learning. To what degree machine learning is going to have to be integrated in these systems? Is it going to be supervised, unsupervised, individual, you know, learning or more generic learning, that, that sort of thing? Um, so you want to know a little bit more about how the backend things work, supervised or unsupervised and things? just how important you think it will be. Sorry? How important you think it will be. Okay. Yeah, so for technology-wise, we use both supervised uh, um, and unsupervised technology to improve our uh, accuracy. And it works pretty good. And um, I think our reason why there's some importance level we made a lot of tricks and things to improve accuracy. but. One more important thing that which benefits a lot is the data itself. We, uh, by tuning and receiving more and more data, the both we get benefit for both supervised and unsupervised. So that's keep our accuracy improving, which is really important to us. I think machine learning is the way to go, but it's like the last mile, right? In mm -hmm. Comcast or at and the last mile is a limiting factor. I don't think you'll ever be able to get away with never supervising it. It's impossible. Our intents change, what we need, what we want. You need a human interaction to know that. Exactly. I mean, the process is more like how baby learn the word. Like first step, probably from some supervised information, the mom tell him, uh, this is a TV, this is a person, this is a phone kind of thing. But by telling and engaging with certain level of information, then the baby have the capability to learn and to expand his knowledge. And then later on, even when new type of TV came out, or new type of phone came out, the baby still can recognize it is a phone. That is the difference, like the first initial steps, we need some supervised thing to input and to extract some of the key features, let the computer know what is that. And later on, the, it is more like unsupervised technology, which is keep improving the knowledge base as well as accuracy when like encounter with more and more new things in the daily life. Um, 3D pictures uh, using phone never took off. STC had a very nice Android phone that you could take 3D pictures. Um, do you see 3D pictures coming back, uh, perhaps in, or maybe they're back in Asian markets, or is there more interest in them, and, or is it completely dead and we're not going to see 3D pictures at all? So, I, I mean, to do 3D pictures in the traditional way, you need two sensors, and that adds a lot of cost. But there are some newer sensors that, um, that John talked about that, that are capturing depth. Uh, there's a startup here in the valley called Pelican Imaging that has an array of 16 4x4 sensors. And one of the byproducts of these new sensors is they can also capture 3G. 
So I think the traditional approach of putting two traditional sensors, I don't see that happening. But some of these new sensors that do depth, they will also do 3D. Yeah, I don't think it's the what, I think it's the how, right? So it's all about how far we can go into lighting algorithms, right? Predicting where the light angle and how the cheapest way possible to do that in order to predict what a 3D object would look like out of a 2D object, right? Depending on how the light is hitting the sensor, if you get the angle, I mean, that's a light show thing, right? They do it with two sensors, but as you said, if you, if you can do it with one, in software you get a similar or hopefully the same eventual result without the cost. Yeah, Pelican was actually the company I was thinking about that I saw the demo at the uh, Qualcomm conference, but uh, I think essentially, yeah, for from OEM's perspective where it's, you know, the cost um, gets affordable, it might become a natural default, and whether or not users uh, adopt it, of course, is going to be, um, you're, we're just going to have to see. I mean, at CES, um, I did see, you know, Ultra 3D uh, without glasses, and uh, because of the increased resolution, I was actually kind of uh, impressed with the quality, um, but uh, at least with 3D video without glasses, I was watching some movie, I forget, uh, that the latest Ang Lee one where they're on the ocean, and I actually got motion sickness, so I was just like, I was just like yeah, I don't know about 3D um, <laughs> video, but maybe 3D photos uh, could eventually take off, especially if, if in the future, in 20 years, where we do have huge screens all over the place, that, that could be truly immersive, but, um, but you know, we'll, we'll see. Hi, my name is Perry, and uh, I have a question about the 4K uh, commercialization in the mobile side. And uh, as John Lin mentioned, that uh, Qualcomm introduced the 4K uh, uh, video solution already. But the, you know, uh, the the net there might be a network burden because of a uh, more bigger uh, uh, the image size. So, uh, do you think uh, 4K can be uh, implemented and serviced on uh, LTE or even? after 5G or something, what's so, the prospect? Yeah, so let me take this. I mean, right now, Qualcomm has 4K in their latest uh, uh, chipsets. I think it's the Snapdragon 805, yeah, 805. Uh, but it uses the older H.264 technology. So if you actually record 4K with that, with one of the two phones that uses uh, that particular chipset, the bit rate is around 50 megabits per second, which is almost too high, too high to be practical. The, your, your flash is consumed incredibly rapidly, moving the files, even transferring them on USB 3 is painful. So in our view, and I think in the view of, of CES, anyone that's really going to deploy 4K is going to use H.265 or HEBC that can half or even more because you get better compression efficiency with, with larger uh, uh, resolutions. So. Um, I think 4K will absolutely happen, but people like Netflix and others will use H.265, which I'm sure will be in a Qualcomm chip soon, uh, but it's not there quite today. In terms of uh, actually recording video to local storage, I mean, I think the use case instead of streaming would be, you know, storing to record memories um, for your own personal use. Uh, I mean, storage at a different conference, you know, they're talking about, uh, I think, either Samsung or SanDisk. I mean, right now, phones are coming up with, you know, 16 gigabytes to 32. I mean, in another year or two, you know, 128, you know, gigabytes of storage on your phone is not inconceivable. And then a couple years out, half a terabyte, I mean, it's kind of crazy to think, but, you know, Moore's Law is still marching along, so. But remember, 50 megabytes, a megabits a second. You know, a gigabyte lasts very, very quickly. You know, I, I could do the maths, but it's you know, you know, 16 gigabytes will give you some small amount of minutes. Cool. I think we'll wrap it up. Um, panelists will stay on. Uh, we'll be around, right? That's more questions. We're good here for another 45 minutes. I think we have their tickets still up at the front desk if you guys want more drinks. Um, and I guess we'll give a hand of applause to the panel. <laughs> also, a special thanks to our staff and well for making tonight happen. And we will see you, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you.